Make sure that this is in fact a practice exam. So, but the idea is that you hopefully you've done this at home. You're going to come. You're going to look at this. You're going to fly through it. If we have any questions as we go, please ask, and we'll talk about it as much as we need. All right. Here we're doing simple IUPAC naming on um, <clears throat> alkanes and cyclooalkanes. When we look at this first one, we see that this is a cyclopentane, that we have an ethyl group and we have a methyl group. They are located one and three relative to each other. Now, the ethyl group alphabetically is going to get carbon number one. We realize that in a cyclopentane, we need to worry about stereochemistry. In this particular drawing, <clears throat> we can easily define the ring plane. And we have one up and one down. That's going to be trans stereochemistry. So the pieces we need to include in our name we have to say trans. <clears throat> trans defines our stereochemistry. We have an ethyl group in carbon one, a methyl group in carbon three, and we would simply string them together. Trans, one ethyl, three methyl, cyclopentane. Yeah? So when do you know when you have to use trans and cis? Well, whenever you have stereochemistry that's apparent. Right now, in this first exam, that's going to be limited to things like cyclealkanes, where we have you know, clearly defined ring planes and things above and below. When we do uh, alkenes, because there's no rotation around a double bond, we'll also reintroduce cis and trans for that. And then we're going to change it all. And we're going to call it E and Z. Going to do R and S for cyclealkanes. Going to make it all much more complicated. But right now we're doing it simply. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, why did you count um, the counterclockwise? Well, I did counterclockwise because this gives us one, two, three. Uh, so this one will be one, three. Lowest number. This way it'd be one, four. So you always want to start with the longest. So no, like a we can start alphabetically still. here. Yeah, we could have one methyl, or we could have one ethyl. <coughs> ethyl comes first out of that. So if it was a propyl ethyl, you'd start with that. With the methyl. If it was propyl, you would start with methyl. Copy that. Our next guy here. We have a cyclohexane. There's no stereochemistry shown, so you don't have to put it in. As we look at our substituents around the ring, we have a one, one substituent. That's two things on one carbon. So that's going to make this carbon number one. Now we need to decide which way to go. Well, if we go clockwise here, we're going to have a one, one, two carbon. If we went counterclockwise, we would have a one, one, Three. Two is less than three. Therefore, <clears throat> we're going to go clockwise here. On carbon one, we're going to have a bromine. On carbon one, we're going to have a chlorine. And on carbon two, and let's see, two, three, four, five, two and five, three and five, I'm sorry, two and five, we're going to have methyl groups. That should be two and five. <clears throat> if we string all these together, uh, please change that to two five. I'm sorry. One bromo, one chloro, two five dimethyl cyclohexane. Carbon one, carbon two, three, four, and five. Uh, 
I would have lost one. So it's like each question just represents like no, each question will be worth uh, four points. Uh, there will be 25 questions just like this, and probably an extra price. So if we forgot, like, the ashes, would you take off points for that? Yep. yep. Instead of just getting zero out of the four? Yep. Yep. All right, this next thing looks like a strange little symbol of some sort. It's actually very simple, though, isn't it? You identify your longest chain here. It's going to be one, two, three, four, five carbons, no matter how you go. Well, let that be carbon one. If that's carbon one, then on carbon number three, we simply have two ethyl groups. So we have a pentane. We have two ethyl groups in carbon number three. We would call this briefly diethyl pentane. Now in chapter five, <clears throat> we will learn that this is actually a very unique carbon center. It has four different substituents attached to it. It has an ethyl group, it has a propyl group, a methyl, and a chlorine. Four different substituents. In chapter five, we will call this a chiral center. And we will learn the neat thing about it is that this molecule is not superimposable on its mirror. But that's chapter five. That's just something exciting to look forward to. All right, right now we're just going to name it and we're not going to worry about our chiral center. As we look at this, we have a chain with one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. So this is going to be a hexane. We're going to let this be carbon one, not this one, because this puts our substituents here in carbon number three. If we started here, it would be in carbon four. In carbon number three, we have a methyl group and we have a chlorine. Alphabetically, we're going to name it as a 3 chloro 3 methyl hexane. There is no cis trans. Nope. Again, in chapter five, we will learn that we will define this as uppercase R. But that's chapter five. All right, this next one just looks like it goes everywhere, doesn't it? Just sprawled all over the page. What you have to do here is just simply trace out your longest chain. Let's start down here with carbon number one. <clears throat> We're going to go one, two, three, four, five, six. We could do one, two, three, four, five. I think this is best. It's going to be, I'm sorry, that was seven, as a heptane. If we start down here in carbon one, our first substituent would be in carbon 3, and that's just an ethyl. Up here in carbon 4, we're going to have another ethyl. So again, it's a diethyl, and our parent is simply a heptane. All right, we want to draw the structure of cis, 1,3-dimethyl cyclopentane. Does it matter if we draw the up, down arrows? <laughs> the wedge bonds? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could draw wedge bonds or you can draw perspective. 
um, I would certainly take either one. All right, our parent here is going to be a cyclopentane. We're going to have substituents in one and three. They're both methyl groups and they're cis. So I would start off just drawing my cyclopentane. I put open valences here in carbons one and three. <clears throat> Our methyl groups must be cis to each other. So I simply put those in so that the two methyls are on the same side of our molecule. Yeah? Can you draw the hydrogens? I'm sorry? Can I have to draw the hydrogens? If you put in the open valences like this, yes, you do. Uh, because otherwise, it just looks funny. <clears throat> if you used wedge bonds, where you simply show the methyl coming up, coming up, or the wind back, as long as they both had the same stereochemistry, that would be it. So yeah. whenever we're doing a cis or a trans, it's always going to have the H3C and the CH3. Going to have what? The H3C and the CH3. Uh, well, it depends on what's cis and trans. I mean, if this is both being chlorines. They're both methyls. Well, what indicates it? What indicates Well, what you want to do is look here at the plane of the ring. And here's our cyclopentane. Both of these methyls are sticking up. It's both sticking up and on the same side, and by definition, that's cis. Yeah, but I mean, why <coughs> use those two compounds? I'm sorry? Why use those two compounds instead of chlorine, for example? Oh, I don't know. It was just a name. It's a methyl. It's a dimethyl cyclopentane. You're just drawing Can we do anything? Any substituent you want. Here we have a bromine and a chlorine, so let's do that. On a cyclohexane. Now, again, we're going to do a cyclohexane. I asked here that this be in its most stable conformation. We're going to have substituents in carbons one and two. So, what I would do first is I would draw a perfect chair. And I would put axial and equatorial valences here in carbons one and four. Now, because this is trans, one of these has to be pointing up, and the other has to be pointing down. They have to be on opposite sides of our ring plane. Right? We can do that by putting them both axial, couldn't we? But that would not be the most stable. <coughs> the most stable, we're going to have everything at the forum. So, what we want to do is put <coughs> bromine and chlorine in equatorial positions. By doing this, this one's going up, this one's going down. They are defined as trans. Once again, put in your hydrogens, axial hydrogens, so you could easily tell that these are supposed to both be equatorial. Yeah? So the reason why you put the hydrogens in is just because of the, the trans and the cis? Yeah. So yeah. if you didn't have, if you didn't have, like if you just had one bromo for chlorocyclohexane, is, was the H is still being that support? If you didn't have stereochemistry given, then it wouldn't matter. Okay. I would just go out and fly. Okay. Is that true? If it were to be 1,5, it would be 6. Well, <coughs> if we had substituents here and they were trans, <coughs> then chlorine would have to be axial, hydrogen, equatorial. We're drawing a pentane here. Three ethyl, two methyl. Can't get much simpler than that, can we? So let's draw five carbons in a row. And we're going to find that as our parent chain. 
And look at this. We're going to define what are the ends here. That's carbon number one. So let's make this carbon number one. That means we're going to have in carbon two a methyl group, in carbon three an ethyl group. And that's all you have to draw. Now, if you were to name this compound, you could look at this and say, all right, I have one, two, three, four, five carbons. It's a pentane, right? And this thing sticking up, we could call it isopropyl group. But calling it iso three isopropyl pentane would be wrong, wouldn't it? Why? <clears throat> Corollary to rule number two, you want the greatest number of substituents, the greatest number of side chains. By making this our parent here, by making this our parent, we wind up with two substituents. If we had this as our parent, we would just have one substituent. Always go to the greatest number of substituents. But then, yet again, it doesn't matter how you draw the structure. You know it is. Oh, it doesn't matter how you draw it. Because I drew it like that. Yep, that'll work. That'll work. <clears throat> Trans 1,2-dibromocyclohexane using a chair in its most stable conformation. So once again, start off by drawing a perfect chair, and I'm going to show axial and equatorial bonds in carbons 1 and 2. Now our serial chemistry here is going to be trans. That means that the two bromines are pointing in opposite directions relative to the ring plane. We could put both bromines axial, that would be trans, but it would not be the most stable. To be most stable, both bromines would have to be equatorial. Put our bromines in, <clears throat> one is pointing up, one is pointing down, they are trans relative to the ring plane. Yeah? If the bromine on the bottom was facing that would be the it was um, what, coming out this way? Yeah. That's not where the bond goes. When you draw your perfect cyclohexane, <clears throat> this bond here is parallel to these two. Um, so All right, our last nomenclature here. One bromo, three ethyl, two methyl pentane. I have a question on the last one. Okay. Um, so if it's trans, it has to be on um, like opposite sides, right? right? But that will work on the same side. No, <clears throat> these are both. Remember, you if you tip this a bit more, our ring plane is defined as the average of all of these things because it is zigzag up and down. But the simplest way to think about it is to just look at it and say, in my drawing, this bromine's pointing up, this one's pointing down. Up, down, trans. Up, up, cis. Yeah? Uh, to me, it seems like, I guess at first glance, I would put them on the axis. They would Bromines look like they're farther apart. Well, you know, that's they would still be trans if they were axial, but remember, if you put this big clunk of bromine up here, we get great interference with the axial hydrogens. So that makes axial groups bad. <clears throat> the rule we remember is equatorial is good, axial is bad. So you can have something that's trans, but it's still both. Yep. Again, look at the drawing. One's pointing up, one's pointing down.
All right, doing with pentane here. It was a bromine in carbon one, an ethyl group in carbon three, and a methyl group in carbon two. Start off applying a pentane, any old pentane. You're going to define one carbon as being carbon number one, and we're going to put a bromine on that carbon. <coughs> Here's our carbon number one, and we've attached a bromine. And carbon number two, so that's, that's one, so this is two, we need a methyl group. Oh, I guess I put ethyl in there, so alphabetically. So this is carbon three, here's my ethyl, and a carbon two, we need the methyl. You can start from the other <clears throat> side, though. Sure, sure. Remember, it's rotating. You can draw it any way you want, as long as you have a pentane parent, bromine in one, methyl in two, ethyl in three. All right, our next guy here, we have this very simple little molecule, and we simply want to convert it to a Newman. Now, specifically, this says carbon-4 is going to be our front carbon. Carbon number 3 is the back. So, as we number this, this is going to be carbon-1, and 3 and 4 are down here. So, all you have to do when you're given this is to just ask the question, what's attached to carbon number 4? We have two hydrogens and a methyl group. So in our front carbon, which is carbon-4, we need two hydrogens and a methyl group. Carbon-4 has two hydrogens and a methyl group. Now our back carbon here, number three, <clears throat> is also going to have two hydrogens, isn't it? And it has an isopropyl attached. So I will take my carbon number three, which is the guy in the back, and I will put my two hydrogens in. And in the remaining valence here, I will simply draw my isopropyl. And that is my newman. This down here I just labeled as carbon one, just so you can follow it. Let's kind of do this again. Carbon four, two hydrogens and a methyl. Carbon-3, two hydrogens, and an isopropyl. Sorry, I was confused of where the two hydrogens are. Well, remember, in a line drawing, every vertex is a CH2, isn't it? So this represents a CH2. So carbon-4 must have two hydrogens and the methyl. Every vertex is a CH2. This is a CH and a CH3. Make sure you can do the line drawing stuff. Why did you start as one, three, four? When you numbered it, you started with one, three, four. Right, because. Why do you know that the, that middle one's the fourth carbon? Well, that, that, that's what it said. So <coughs> Right, this is, in this molecule, this is carbon number one. And our first substituent is in carbon two. Yeah. Do we have to draw a proposal or do we do the one? Yeah, that's okay. So if you didn't have carbon four as the front and carbon three as the back, huh. it would look totally different. Yeah. Yeah, it would. 
That's why the, the problem was defined as which one is three and four, or which one is front and back. All right, we're making a cyclohexane again. It's a one, two, four trimethyl. We are told that methyl groups on one and two are cis, and one and four are trans. As always, we want the most stable. So we're going to start off drawing, again, a perfect cyclohexane. And I put valences here in carbons one, two, and four. Now because we want our most stable conformation, we're going to try to get as many things equatorial as we can. We're told that in carbon number one and two, we have methyl groups that are cis. Now cis would mean that they're both going up or they're both going down. Let's go ahead and put a methyl here. That means our cis methyl is going to have to be going down in carbon 2, so it's going to have to be here. So we have cis methyls. Again, look at the drawing. They're both pointing down. That means they're cis. Now we go over here to carbon 4. We're told that 1 and 4 are trans. So here our methyl on carbon 1 is pointing down. That means that methyl in carbon 4 must be pointing up. And that is our trouble. We have two equatorial groups. That's good. One axial that we just stuck with. Now remember, if we did a ring inversion here, we would have two axials and one equatorial. Everything that's equatorial becomes axial. Everything that's axial becomes equatorial. If we were to draw this in regular like cyclohexane instead of a chair would be acceptable. You know, works. probably not because this is a draw a chair. <laughs> the next question was an absolutely trivial one. Let's draw the Lewis structure from methanol. If you just look at methanol, which is given here, we're going to have a carbon bonded to three hydrogens. Carbon is group four, four valence electrons, hydrogens one each. We're going to have three covalent bonds, one to each hydrogen. It's going to look like this. We remember that oxygen is group six. It is the high valence, so it will have two bonds to it, and it will have two unshared pairs of electrons. Finally, our hydrogen is going to be bonded to the oxygen, and we just need to draw it like that. Perfectly acceptable answer. Oh, very simple counting exercise. <clears throat> How many sp squared carbons do we have here? Or atoms, atoms, not carbons, atoms. Obviously, these guys here in the ring are, but we need to recognize that this nitrogen is also sp squared. 
just like the oxygen and the carbonyl is sp squared, and so is the carbonyl carbon. So as we run around our ring here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight sp squared atoms. Anything with a double bond to it is going to be sp squared. Now this next one will make it absolutely nuts. Which of the following is 225-trimethyl hexane? It will make you nuts. I know. <clears throat> what I would suggest doing in this problem is just to look at them and figure out what the parent chain is as step one. Okay? Now here we have a carbon with two methyls attached and a carbon with three methyls attached, right? If we were to number this in order to find our longest sequence. We would have to begin with one of these methyls and end with one of these methyls because they'll all be in the chain. So, just counting, we have one, two, three, four, and five. Our longest chain here is a pentane. This is a hexane, that's not it. Our next one. Again, we're going to start with two carbons on this guy, three carbons on this one. So we have to count beginning here. One, two, three, four, five, six. The good news is this is a hexane. Our next one. <clears throat> we have three carbons attached to this guy. So, one, two, three, four, five. It's a pentane. Two carbons, three carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's a heptane. So we only have one hexane in the group, don't we? So it's either this one or none of them. Don't you hate the none of the above? <laughs> so let's see if the name matches. <clears throat> we need 225 trimethyl. Remember, one of these is going to be part of our main chain. So we're going to have one. This is carbon two. So that's two methyls attached. Three, four, Five. This is part of our chain, and we have one methyl here. It actually looks like this, and that is the correct answer. This carbon, this one here, we have to count one of these as part of our main chain, one of these as part of our main chain. I have two extra carbons here on carbon 2 and one on carbon 5. That one's a little tricky. Yeah? Will it not be trimethyl? Nope. And remember, <coughs> this carbon does have three methyls attached to this one. But when you're looking for your longest chain, one of these has to count as far as the chain goes. Oh, okay. That's why it's a little tricky. Which of these are isomers? <clears throat> Remember, isomers are going to be the same numbers and types of atoms, simply arranged differently 
in space. These are all clearly different molecules. So what you want to do is make sure they have the same numbers and types of atoms. This first one, we have six, seven carbons. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve hydrogens. We have five carbons in the ring, six, seven. That's six hydrogens, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Six carbons in the ring, seven, <coughs> eight, nine, ten, oh, whatever. Twelve hydrogens. <laughs> All we've done from here to here, if you notice, is move our double bond from here to here. And finally here, we have seven carbons, but we have one, two, three, four, five, Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, counting the level, hydrogens. So these three are different compounds with the same formula, and they are all isomers. Yeah. Uh, would be something with the same number, same formula, but different types? Because you said the same number and the same types of atoms. Um, it, well, if we had an oxygen in here, that's what I meant. Okay. But then the <coughs> formula would not be different. Right. The formula would be different. Um, it would not be an isomer. Okay. So you can just go with like the same number of the same formula would be fine. Yep. 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 Just connect it differently. All right, what is true regarding <coughs> cyclohexanes? Remember, we can look at <coughs> the table that's in McMurray, or we could simply remember the more equatorial, the better. So A is obviously correct. B, ring inversion requires 180 degree rotation. Well, you can't really do that in a ring, can you? You can't flip it all the way around because it's connected. So that's wrong. <coughs> and equatorials are disfavored? No. Axial are disfavored, not equatorials. So the only correct answer is A. molecule, which we have forced up into a boat. <clears throat> two of the methyls are axial, two of the methyls are equatorial. All the methyls are axial, all substituents are equatorial, or none. <clears throat> what I would do here is I would take my boat and I would simply draw it as a chair. And if you can't do this, practice it, okay? We're going to do this stepwise. What I'm going to do is look and say, okay, this end here, ignore this, this end here is kind of pointing up like the end of a chair, isn't it? So I'm going to draw myself a chair of some sort, and I've put in <coughs> my axial and equatorial bonds here. <coughs> now these differ slightly because this is pointing in a bit as opposed to straight up. So you also have to just take and rotate this a touch in your mind so this hydrogen and this methyl are going straight up and down. All right. So now I'm going to take this end of the molecule and place it on my template here. 
that means this end of the molecule is pointing up. Right? <coughs> so to make this a chair, all I have to do is grab this end and move it down. Now note, as we do this, <coughs> on this carbon, methyl is higher than hydrogen. Relatively speaking, methyl is on top of hydrogen. So when we move it down here, the methyl is still going to be above the hydrogen. That's a simple thing to look at to know where to put the two in our final drawing. So, again, what we did, drew just a skeleton of a chair. Rotate just a tiny bit so my hydrogen and methyl are nice and vertical. Makes it pretty. Grab this end, move it down, remembering methyl up, hydrogen down. Fill them in. Now we can answer our question. <clears throat> we have two equatorial methyls and one that is axial. All right, so whenever you have a boat, you want to leave the one side how it is, usually. That's the simplest way, right? right? Leave one side the way it is, flip the other one down, and fit it into a chair. So we have two equatorial methyls, one axial. Two methyls are equatorial. <clears throat> Obviously, we don't want two axial. We don't want all axial, and they cannot all be equatorial. Practice this little operation. I hope nobody missed this one. Here we have C2H4O. And we can draw lots of, lots of isomeric structures. One of these, however, is nonsense. Which one is nonsense? D. Here we have a carbon. It's a CH3 group, carbonyl and hydrogen. <clears throat> Two sp squared carbons and no H. Here we have two sp cubed carbons bonded to an octagon as a bridge called an epoxide. You've heard of epoxy resin, that's it. Perfectly legal. But here, oh my gosh, we have one carbon with three bonds and one carbon with five bonds. That is like the greatest affront you can do to an organic chemist. Carbon has four bonds, okay? Don't insult me. If it were nitrogen, then it would be fine. Well, if this was a nitrogen, that would be okay. But you need something here that can have five bonds to it. It'd have to be a sulfur or something like that. Three. <laughs> All right, formal charges on carbon monoxide. <clears throat> Remember, when we do a formal charge, we're going to take our Lewis structure. We're going to split all covalent bonds. And then we're going to compare the number of electrons around the atom with the number of electrons predicted by the periodic table. So, let's split our triple bond. This carbon would then have one, two, three, four, five electrons. Carbon, of course, lives here in group four, doesn't it? It should have four electrons. It has five, therefore, it is minus one. All 
Oxygen has one, two, three, four, five electrons. Oxygen lives in group six, so it should have six electrons. So it's missing one. That means it will be plus one. Split your covalent bonds. <clears throat> give them to whichever atom is on either side. Add in all your unshared. And just simply compare with the group number in the periodic table. Any questions? All right, draw these in their most stable confirmation. And again, on the exam, please draw the new <coughs> instructions. Please. First thing you should note here is that <coughs> we have substituents one, or the one, two, and four, right? But this is a turbutyl. Turbutyl rhymes with basketball, doesn't it? It's huge. It can never, ever, ever be axial. So we're going to have to redraw this, putting the turbutyl <coughs> equatorial. Now, when you do that, Remember, we're doing a ring flip, so everything that is axial will become equatorial. The way I would do it is I would draw a chair. <coughs> I would put my valences in carbons 1, 2, and 4. <coughs> I would put this bromine, which is now equatorial, I would put it axial. This is axial, I would draw it equatorial. This is axial, it becomes equatorial. There is our chair. Our bromine was equatorial, it's now axial. The methyl was axial, it's now equatorial. This is axial, it is now equatorial. Yeah? Why can't you just switch them where they are and like switch the turbulent to the hydrogen? Well, that, that's essentially what you do. <clears throat> but you're going to have to draw it a new one anyway, aren't you? So draw it and put it in. But I mean, it's like on the top corner in that one. Yep. Yeah, it would be incorrect if you just switch No, it. no, I don't want That'll work. In chapter 5, we'll see that that actually gives a different compound, but we're not in chapter 5 yet. I thought you can do that because you can't reach bonds. You can only rotate. Well, it's, it's just an operational thing. <clears throat> just redraw the thing and it, it swap places. Again, it does generate a different compound if you do it that way, as opposed to all right, this next one, we have a boat. We're going to make a chair, right? However, we have, an equi we, we have a turbutyl group again. So when we do our chair, we have to make sure that the turbutyl group winds up equatorial. If you look at the relative positions here, methyl is up, this is down. In a final structure, methyl is going to be above turbutyl, hydrogen will be above methyl. Can you keep it in like a boat form since right now it's too I'm sorry? Can you keep it in a boat? As a boat? Yeah. Uh, you want to redraw them in their most stable chair confirmation. So, 
<clears throat> this carbon, methyl is going to be above terc-butyl. Methyl here, terc-butyl here. Hydrogen above methyl, hydrogen here, methyl here. Just remember, you must put the turf butyl equatorial. Here we have two axial bromines. <clears throat> That's bad. We're going to want two equatorial bromines, aren't we? So we're going to have to do a ring flip. So let's draw another chair with substituents in one and three. <coughs> Our bromines are axial here. They will be equatorial here. Another way to think about it. Bromine will be above methyl. Bromine will be above hydrogen. So, bromine here, methyl here, bromine here, hydrogen here. Bromine above hydrogen, bromine above methyl. Guy. Once again, we have a boat that we have to fiddle with. We have three substituents on it. Carbons 1, 2, and 4. So I draw my chair. Now, I'm going to want to put my bromines equatorial if I can, because they're the biggest things, aren't they? As I look at this, bromine is above hydrogen, isn't it? Bromine up, hydrogen down. So on this carbon, my bromine is going to be equatorial, hydrogen down. This carbon here, hydrogen will be up, and it'll be above the methyl, hydrogen and methyl. And finally in this one, hydrogen above bromine, hydrogen and bromine. This isn't good because we still have an axial bromine, but we're going to be stuck with one or the other. So this has two equatorial substituents, only one axial, this one would have to win. In reality, this would be forced into a little bit of a twisted boat confirmation, but that's reality, and we're not dealing with reality, are we? We don't want to go organic chemistry, of course not. Any questions? For that last one, um, I thought that at the beginning both of the bromines were axial. Well, let's go back. <clears throat> Once again, I've left this end up, right? And just rotated this one down. When I did that, when I did that, bromine is always going to be above hydrogen. So this is where the bromine goes, and the hydrogen must go here. These guys really don't change position much. This is going to be the equatorial, and this is going to be the axial. Hydrogen up over methyl, hydrogen up over bromine. So you, you can only switch that one side? Yeah, I mean, that's all you have to do. Grab this, pull it down. You just stick up here, pull it down. I'm saying that's all that you could do, so like you couldn't do anything else? Oh, yeah. Well, you could do other things. <laughs> this is probably the simplest. Yeah? So, I know on that one handout you gave us, the rings, 
for the chair were the same? If we left it the same but switched it around, like 